Hi everyone, this is Neil Writer here, also known as the Wax Whisperer. Thank you for joining me in my latest video. We have here a very interesting case um, of a patient um, in her teens, she's 15, who attended with bilateral keratosis obturans. And during the course of the video, I'll explain what keratosis obturans is for any new viewer. Um, they have been suffering from a blocked ear, or to say blocked ears, for the last year or so. And they were recently assessed by audiology who were unable for obvious reasons to perform a hearing test or they could perform a hearing test but it wouldn't be accurate because of all this uh, impaction in their ears um, in order to be referred to audiology the patient is normally examined by their gp or nurse and so i'm a bit confused as to why they were referred to audiology for a hearing test given they've got all this wax if they were referred to ENT, I could understand because ENT were able to remove this. But uh, within the National Health Service in the UK, most audiology departments, um, I don't think I think a few do, but the majority don't of don't perform ear wax removal. I know when I used to work for the National Health Service uh, many years ago, um, audiologists back then weren't trained to remove earwax, so we would we'd have a nurse sometimes who's available, an ENT nurse, and we refer the patient to the nurse. The nurse can remove the wax and we can get the patient back in to conclude the rest of their appointment. Otherwise, it would mean the patient uh, having to go away, cancelling the appointment and rearranging after they've had their wax removed. So it's not only inconvenient for the patient, it's, it's also inconvenient for the audiology department. Now, I believe more and more NHS departments are offering earwax removal services, but I know our local one's not. Um, hence why, obviously, the patient was advised to have this removed. So, keratosis obturans, what is it? Now, keratosis obturans is a buildup of dead skin. Um, so this is not earwax, it's a dead skin plug. Before I continue to explain what keratosis obturans is, um, I'll just, ex just briefly explain why you're watching uh, the procedure itself. Now, this patient's got quite narrow and bendy ear canals, so there's very little room to maneuver. And the entrance of the ear canal in particular was extremely narrow, and it was not collapsed, but it was, um, the entrance is a lot more slit, so it's more, more elongated. It's less space, essentially, and that's possibly a reason why this patient's suffering from the condition that she's got, because of the keratosis obturans, is unable to naturally migrate out of the ear because of the ear anatomy. When you've got an extremely bendy, narrow, twisty ear canal, dead skin can find it more difficult to migrate, and then it can slow down and it can gather into a plug. So that's a, a, a potential reason why this patient's got this condition. But it just made the, the procedure far more difficult. And um, the consistency of, of keratosis obturans, it mimics, um, it can get various types of consistency. Sometimes you get a really hard, crusted, dead skin. But typically with keratosis obturans, and you can view my playlist on my YouTube channel. So uh, I know a few of you may be watching this on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok. But if you visit my YouTube channel, The Wax Whisperer, I've got a playlist of keratosis obturans and you can compare the consistency of this plug to some of the other patients. But generally it's like chewing gum um, and it's very elastic, it's very springy. And that's because um, keratosis obturans is made up of an accumulation of sheets of dead keratinous skin and these sheets of dead skin fold upon it, each other and, and also itself. And that gives the, the plug a lot of kinetic energy and a lot of springiness. So it's extremely difficult to remove. It's the most challenging procedure when you remove dead skin like this. Um, and on average, a keratosis obtrans, I would say it's about half an hour plus. Hence, this video, as you can see, it's about 36 odd minutes. And, but I've had some, some cases that it was an hour long. In fact, I had another case today. It was a bit more severe than this one. It was a grade three keratosis obtrans. And I'll try and upload that tomorrow or early next week. But um, that was far more severe. However, I found this a bit more tricky to remove. So you can see that chewing gum type of consistency. I'm using forceps and I've got a good grip here and I'm pulling away, but the plug isn't coming away. Instead, a section of the dead skin plug is being pulled and stretched and elongated. Um, so to remove this, I had to use the full range of instruments, an ear hook, chops and horn, forceps, suction, put some olive oil spray and also some sodium bicarbonate drops so yeah keratosis obtrans is a buildup of dead skin it's different to earwax and on 
first appearance, it can be very difficult to differentiate between the two, but a lot of it's got to do with the texture, as I described earlier. And it's only once you're there inside the ear, uh, you begin to realise, oh, this actually isn't earwax, it's keratitis obturans. And it's important to be able to differentiate because the way you remove it, it, it can be slightly different. For example, um, if you've got keratitis obturans, you'll typically instill sodium bicarbonate drops into the ear to, to assist if you require the drops, as opposed to olive oil spray. Um, with earwax, I generally use olive oil spray. And the reason for that is when you've got dead skin, olive oil doesn't really do much to that dead skin, um, whereas sodium bicarbonate drops does. And that's because sodium bicarbonate, when it enters the ear, it um, reacts with uh, an acid that's secreted and produced by bacteria that reside on the, the, the skin itself. Um, so it's, it's healthy bacteria, they feed off the sebum in the ears. The sebum is a fatty, oily secretion um, produced by sebaceous glands, which are attached to the hair follicles. And the bacteria feed off the sebum and they release a, a type of acid known as a carboxylic acid. And the sodium bicarbonate drops reacts with that particular acid and it transforms, it converts into a gas, so carbon dioxide. And during that conversion, that transformation, you get effervescence, you get uh, bubbling and foaming. And that mechanical foaming and um, effervescence helps to break up the dead skin. So that's why it's sometimes good with, it doesn't dissolve it, but it breaks it up a bit. But it, sodium bicarbonate is also, um, it, it also converts into water and the dead skin absorbs the water, it swells, it expands the, the dead skin and then it bursts the membranes of the dead skin cells. So it helps, helps to break up dead skin. So hence why it's really important to be able to differentiate between keratosis obturans and earwax when performing clinical ear care. Um, so this skin that I'm removing and it's formed into plug, it uh, once upon a time was lining the canal wall and our ears, um, as the skin dies and sheds, it's replaced by another layer of skin. And that dead skin then makes the journey out of the ear. We call it the epithelial migration. So the outer layer of skin, the epidermis, it's made up of epithelial skin cells. And they are, they get five layers and they're, they're, they are shaped like pancakes, almost like, or, or, or fish scales. In fact, the technical term for these skin cells are keratinous, um, stratified, squamous, um, epithelial skin and the term squamous is I believe Latin or uh, Greek for fish scales and so this, the migration occurs from the center of the eardrum so the outermost layer of the eardrum is also made of the same skin that lines the inner two-thirds of the ear canal as the skin dies sheds and it's replaced by another layer of skin that skin begins its journey out of the ear and it moves sideways out of the eardrum um, slowly but surely uh, across the ear canal till it eventually escapes out of the ear. And the rate of migration is between 1.5 millimetres a month to 3 millimetres a month. So it does vary upon the individual. And that natural uh, migration of skin is really, really important to, for the ear. First of all, it, it prevents the buildup of dead skin plugs like this patient. So when that epithelial migration doesn't work in someone's ears. They suffer from a dead skin plug like this. Also, it helps to transport any wax sitting on the surface of the dead skin. So that dead skin, that um, shedding process, think about it like a conveyor belt. It slowly moves out of the ear and then any debris wax sitting on the surface is also naturally transported out of the ear. So it's the ear's self-cleansing mechanism, this epithelial migration. However, when that dead skin fails to migrate, it accumulates into a plug. And specifically with keratosis obtrans, that dead skin, as it dies and sheds, it should almost shed into its individual skin cells and then slowly migrate. But with, with keratosis obtrans, though that skin cells, although they're dead, they're still attached to one another. So they uh, die and shed in sheets as opposed to individual cells. And these sheets then fold upon each other. Um, so there's different reasons why it could happen. It could be um, the blood flow at a particular part of the ear canal, it's reduced 
and therefore the skin migration is slower in that particular region and it's too slow and then it eventually clogs up and forms into a plug. It could be the ear anatomy, the ear canal could be bendy or twisty, or there can be uh, an abnormality in the ear canal. So, for example, a, a pothole or a trench or a widening of a natural widening of the ear where the skin falls in and it collects into uh, a plug. Apologies for this bit. I thought I edited it out, but obviously not. It's just me coming out the ear, wiping the lens and blocking the suction tube. So you get this plug and this plug just gets bigger and bigger and it gets if it's untreated it can become extremely painful so one of the clinical diagnostic symptoms of a keratosis obturans is ear pain so most people um, suffer from ear pain and this patient will experience mild ear, ear pain so you get different grading systems of keratosis obturans grade one is mild pain um, negligible widening of the ear canal so this plug as it gets bigger it's got so much force and pressure that it begins to widen the bony part of the ear canal and just to put that in context the bone the bony part of the ear canal is called the temporal bone it's the considered to be the second strongest bone in the body behind the femur so you can imagine just how much pressure and how big this plug must be, be get in order to for it to start to physically change and alter and widen the bony part of the ear canal. And that's the pain. You've got the pressure against the ear canal. Um, so with a grade one, it's um, mild pain, uh, minimal widening, if, if no widening. Um, grade two is when there is um, more visible, uh, there is mild widening of the ear canal. There's a bit more pain, uh, a bit more hearing loss. Uh, but there's the, the widening is visible. That's that's the key of grade two. Grade one, it's not always visible. Um, and it's probably similar levels of pain as grade one. Grade three is when you've got moderate widening um, and you've got um, some granulation tissue. So granulation tissue is, you can think about it like healing or inflammatory tissue. It, because this skin plug is really widening the ear canal, we, it's experiencing trauma. The body's response is to produce granulation tissue, which is connective tissue essentially, which forms into a sac and it has its own blood supply, its own blood vessels. So it's like a red bumpy surface. It can be sometimes be moist. So that's a hallmark of grade three. And a grade four is extremely um, dangerous really because the ear canal widens so much that it forms part of the, the, the bone behind the ear canal, the mastoid bone, which is typically a separate piece of bone but they, it merges it's that much widening and that normally needs surgical uh, removal because it's so painful obviously a lot of bleeding um, and also surgical correction so it, there might be that they the surgeons try to build up the, the ear canal wall again um, but I, I think I've come across a grade four once and we just had to refer it directly to ENT it was, it was it was obviously this patient needed to have a, a procedure, surgical procedure done as opposed to an outpatient's appointment. So this patient I would classify as a grade one uh, because it's mild pain, uh, just a bit of widening of the ear canal, uh, minimal. But now they know what, what they're suffering from, um, I've, I've advised, advised them to, and I tell all my patients really, not to get water in the ear, avoid poking in the ear, whether it's with your fingernail, a uh, bobby pin, a uh, cotton bird Q-tip, whatever you may call, call it. And I've also asked them just to use um, some softening drops on a regular basis. So I've recommended olive oil in this instance. Um, I would normally, as I said, recommend sodium bicarbonate, but because this is post-treatment aftercare, I think the oil will help to moisturise the skin and get it soft before it forms into a plug so and oil is far safer to use medical this is medical grade olive oil it's far safer to use than um, other types of drops now it's not to say the other drops are, are dangerous and they're going to cause you uh, misheart but because they came to in water uh, the other types of drops like sodium bicarbonate and hydrogen peroxide water in the ear sometimes can lead to swimmer's ear and infection although both sodium bicarbonate drops and hydrogen peroxide drops are antiseptic but it, it, and the skin cells get macerated because they get damp and wet. Um, and also these drops are alkaline. 
whereas our ear is slightly acidic. Olive oil is slightly acidic as well. So I'm always a big fan of um, olive oil spray or drops, but on rare occasions I do recommend sodium bicarbonate. I'm not the biggest fan of hydrogen peroxide drops because they tend to turn the wax into a really mushy, almost like this, if truth be told, because this is quite mushy, chewing gummy, and it makes it really difficult to remove. Now, we're making good progress. Uh, the patient was brilliant and very still throughout. Um, they were a bit anxious. They were, they were asking a few times, because I did explain it's going to be quite a lengthy procedure, because keratosis optrans always is, and they were a bit worried that we wouldn't be able to remove it, but I reassured them that we'll definitely get this done today without a shadow of a doubt, and we did. So this is that final plug. You can see it's really mushy, glutinous, and I'm just going to extract this out of the ear. Believe it or not, um, this ear was the better ear out of the two. Um, and we're already on about 16 minutes now. This is 16 minutes of the, 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 the video footage, but obviously in reality, we've probably been there for about 20, maybe 25 minutes because occasionally we're coming out of the ear to clean the instruments, to wipe the lens of the endoscope, to have a chat with the patient to make sure they're okay. So I was bracing myself for another at least 20, 25 minutes for their right fit once I remove this. So just using the hook, getting in behind. And it was at this juncture where it was difficult to remove because there is a narrowing between, because their patient's got a bendy ear. So we have two bends in the ear. We have the first bend, which is about a half a centimetre into the ear canal, and the second bend is about another further half a centimetre into the ear. So, And it's the distance, it's, it's the region between the first and second bend. We call that the isthmus. There's also, an isthmus is just a medical term for narrowing, and we do have another isthmus in the ear as we approach the eardrum about half a centimetre away. The eardrum narrows and widens again. But... So one of the narrow sections of the ear canal is the region between the first and second bend, and that's where you've got trapped there, that plug. So that's the patient's eardrum. Uh, you can see it's very mild, visible widening at least. Just a bit of dead skin on the posterior canal wall. It's been softened because the patient has been using drops prior to coming. So the skin is macerated. It's soft and wet. So I like to remove that. So it's, it's quite a revelation for the patient that they were able to hear. They're a bit surprised by the increased sound levels. So it's lovely to see as an audiologist the difference we could make with this patient. So this is their right ear. Now, I saw another case of soft trans today. I might have mentioned it earlier, uh, grade three. And I'll try and upload that over the weekend or early next week. And that was um, quite a severe case. They had extremely uh, swollen ear, a lot of bleeding, a lot of granulation tissue. And they actually went to um, the hospital yesterday because they experienced so much earache. Um, they went to a &E and uh, on the NHS, a &E don't offer earwax removal. In extreme circumstances, I think they can call the ENT on, on call, but the... Uh, the hospital advised the patient to to contact myself, which they did, and so we got them in the following day as an emergency appointment. And yeah, it's a very interesting video that one, and I will upload that in due course. So with the right ear, uh, the patient did pretty warn me that this was the worst ear. So the, the the first section came away pretty straightforwardly. I'm using a combination of a scoop and a hook, but again, it's a very narrow entrance and. When you've got a narrow entrance like this, it does somewhat restrict your maneuverability. But I'm just trying to clear the entrance. And once I've cleared the entrance, I can also insert the endoscope past those hairs so I can get a better view. Because this keratosis subtrans is right near the entrance, you've got those hairs there. And sometimes they kind of, I wouldn't say block my view, but it can be a bit of an obstruction. We can still see what we're doing, but I prefer a slightly better view, and I'm sure um, the viewers always like a better view. Um, so, just trying to clear the entrance for this patient. You can see I'm using the forceps and I'm really tugging away, but this plug, it's so firmly embedded within the ear canal. It's so hard to remove. 
So I think I'm just going to go over the top now with an ear hook, we shall see. And as I'm extracting this, I'm rotating the instrument a lot to, in conjunction with the curvature of the ear canal. So you've got this bendy section near the entrance. Uh, I'm trying to come away with the instrument in line with that curvature. As, otherwise, I'll make contact with the bony part of the ear canal, which would be uncomfortable. So again, I'm just using the Jobson horn. I'm going to the back part. I'm trying to lift it off the back part of the ear canal. This one's still really adhered to the canal wall. And when I'm behind, I'm turning the Jobson horn and slowly coming forwards, trying to scoop out some of this keratosis obturans. And so far, so good. I was making really good progress. And then we're probably about halfway into the ear canal here. But the deeper we go into the ear, the more careful you're going to be with the instruments because the, I probably explained it. I know some of you have watched my videos a fair number of times and you may not like me to re-explain, but we always get new viewers, subscribers to the channel. So I always like to re-explain certain things. So uh, the ear canal itself, um, consider it an auditory tube. So it helps it to uh, transport sounds collected by the pinna, which is the satellite dish on the outside of the ear, to the middle ear, to the eardrum. And the average length of the ear canal, an adult ear, um, ear canal, is about um, 26 millimetres, so 2.6 centimetres. There is, of course, some variation there. Male ear, ear canals are slightly lot longer than females. Um, children, obviously, have smaller ear canals as well. And... The, the the geometry, the width of the ear canal also varies from individual to individual, but typically the height of the ear canal is greater than the width, which gives an ear canal its oval shape as opposed to a circular round shape. And the width and, down, and the height vary along different sections of the ear canal. So the, end, the very, very outer entrance of the ear canal and the ear canal clo most closest to the eardrum, so most adjacent to the eardrum, is, is considered to be the widest and uh, longest section. And then we get a narrow section, as I said, between the first and second bend, and the second narrowing about half a centimetre away from the eardrum itself. But So the average ear canal, um, the, in terms of ranges, the, the height can be between 0.7 to... Um, one centimetre and the width 0.5 to 0.7. This patient, I would say, significantly less. I would say the, the width is about 0 0.4, 0 0.3 or 4. And the height wasn't that much greater than the width, so about 0 0.5 or 0.6. Just make it more difficult because we've just got limited space to work in and to, to remove this. So the outer ear is made up of cartilage and the inner two thirds of the ear canal is made up of bone. The point at where they meet is called the osseocartilineous portion and we've got skin that lines both the cartilage and the bony part of the ear canal but the skin is different in both sections so the skin that lines the outer third of the ear canal, the epidermis layer is the outermost layer and then you've got the dermis layer where the hair follicles are contained, and the hair follicles are where these hairs that you can see that protrude out of the um, ear canal um, are at its roots. And then you've got the third layer of the skin known as the subcutaneous layer, which is made up of connective tissue and insulating fat. So those three layers combined, uh, the thickness of the skin is around a, a millimetre. But when we enter the bony part of the ear canal, the, the inner two thirds, we just have the outer layer of skin, the epidermis. There is no dermis or subcutaneous layer. So the skin is far more delicate and fragile in the inner two thirds of the ear canal. And it's, it's in comparison to the cartilage portion where the thickness is about a millimeter, this is 10 times thinner, so um, 0.1 mil in thickness. So that skin provides less of a buffer, less of a, a blanket, if you like, 
over the bony part. So the bone is more exposed and of course the bone is rigid, whereas cartilage is not. So if you make contact with that bony part of the ear canal, because the skin's so fragile and thin, it's going to be quite painful. So whenever you use instrumentation, we're normally going over and behind the wax or the dead skin, so you're in close proximity to the canal wall. So whenever you use instruments, you're just going to be far more cautious uh, to try to avoid that. Now, sometimes it's unavoidable. Um, I had a case, that, as I said, that grade three today, and sometimes I had to go on the bony part of the ear canal and glide in my instrument in between the skin plug and the canal wall. So it's making contact, but you just have to be really careful to glide it as opposed to make firm contact. And the patient was fine. They did really well. So just using, I think, forceps here. You can see that chewing gum consistency I was making reference to earlier. I'm really pulling at this. And instead of the plug moving, although some of it is, mainly it's stretching because of the elasticity of the dead skin. So bringing this forward, we're near the entrance now. Let me see, it's stretching. Yeah, I did get a fair bit out with the four sets, but it wasn't always the best instrument to use. So you can see with the hook, I'm gliding in between the skin plug and the canal wall and then rotating the hook clockwise 90 degrees to dissect this. I, in an ideal world, you want to get in behind the skin plug or if it was wax and then extract the hook and as the hook exits the ear, it takes the plug out with it in a single piece. But due to the consistency of this, this dead skin plug, it wasn't to be. So we are making good help ready though. And now I'm using the chops and horn. I'm going to the front part of the ear canal, the anterior canal wall, gliding it in and then repositioning the jobs and horn more centrally into the back of the I'm literally going to go in and right behind and scooping this out. And I it, this is coming up, but I feel the pressure, the pre patient could pre feel the pressure because this plug is much, much larger than the entrance of their ear, so we're having to force this through. So this plug now is it's on its way out. It's half extending out of the ear canal. You can see a lot of that freshly dead skin, the white patches, that's freshly dead skin that has yet to oxidize where the darker patches are the oxidized sections of the dead skin. Now, believe it or not, that plug fell out the ear. It fell um, down onto the patient. Uh, there was a bit of gas when they saw it. Bless them. Um, it was a quite a significant piece. And if you've seen the thumbnail, wait till the end of the, 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 the video. You'll see loads of still images. So the ear canal is clear, but this ear is also infected. They are, you can see the ear canal is quite red. It's slightly swollen. Uh, they're sort of from otitis externa here. So the idea now is to dry up this ear as much as I can. There is also some oil on the eardrum and some drops. So I'm just trying to suction out a lot of most of the debris, dead skin that's still lining the canal and all the moisture that they've got collected. You can perhaps see all that dampness on the eardrum being suctioned. I'm just being careful to hover over. So it's this posterior canal wall we can see all the spongy, it's very spongy, that's another way of uh, an adjective to describe it. Just block the suction tube there. I would say this one is bordering a grade two coat of trans because the widening of the ear canal is a bit more visible. You can see just how sore this ear is, just below the suction tube, just how red that canal is. And this is where the widening is more visible. This plug is beginning to distort and change the shape of the ear canal. So this is the cartilage portion. We can apply a bit more pressure if we like here. I mean, there is also some granulation tissue here. So 
just there. So you could even argue it's bordering with grade three. So I'll say this is definitely a grade two. Um, I'll say two and a half uh, characters of transit. I don't think it's quite a grade three, but we're not far off. So we've got a widening here and also a bit deeper in the air. I'm hovering over. So just to the left there, that's the granulation tissue. You can see the blood vessel there too. And I think I'm going to suction this away. You may get some bleeding when we do. And that skin's quite resistant. It doesn't want to come away. So I'm going to come back for that a bit later, I think. So I'm just going to mop up a bit more near the eardrum. This is all damp, dead skin, macerated dead skin. Uh, they had been using drops as described earlier and the drops would have weeped through the, the skin plug, collected it at uh, the base of the eardrum where we've got a dip. It's like a, a little base in there. So that region, the skin is very macerated. And then there's also some maceration of the skin here posteriorly, I'm using the fine end. And I'm just pre-warning the patient. Uh, they were a bit anxious throughout the, the, the procedure, although they got a lot more comfortable. So I was always explaining throughout what we're doing, asking them how they were, just to put them at ease. And I did um, try to mimic how this would feel in the ear. So on the side of their cheek, I just got the tip, obviously I wiped it first, and just moved it across their cheek so they can get a feel of how it's going to feel in their ears. So there was going to be some contact with the canal wall in order to peel this away, and they were, they were fine with it. So yeah, uh, the, the maceration of the skin could have been due to the drops just collecting in the ear, or the keratosis obtrans itself, it can create sweat and humidity in the ear. It's not going to allow ventilation of the ear canal, so that sweat, humidity can then macerate the skin. So just going to back to that front section near the entrance. So we have referred the patient to their GP so they can get some medication for this. They're going on holiday next week to discuss really strict water precautions, particularly for this patient because of this, this condition and because of the, the otitis externa they've got on their right side. By getting water in the sea, it's going to really exacerbate the infection, I feel. At the moment, it's manageable. We don't want it to get any worse. We're not going to get every little last speck out. Um, we could be literally be here all day. In fact, we ran over quite considerably. Our average appointment slot, well, our allocated appointment slot, should I say, is 30 minutes. So we did have a patient waiting in the waiting room. and But I didn't want to rush this. I wanted to clear out the air. So I did go out into the waiting room just to explain to the, the, the patient waiting that we've just got a bit of a complex case. room. won't be too much longer. I did apologise for the delay. Unfortunately, as a patient, that is a regular, and they appreciate because if it was them who I was treating and I needed a bit more time, then no, I would spend that time with them as well. So they were completely fine with it and understood. You can see just to the left, there's some granulation tissue there. That's stretching, and I just it's just come away from the. It looks quite fleshy. Uh, the keratosis, um, the granulation tissue has got a very fleshy appearance as connective tissue. And I've just curled the tip of the fine, the fine end. It just gives me better entry. No, well, not entry into the ear, but it's because I'm trying to match the curvature of the, the medial ear canal. If that suction tube is straight, you're very likely to make contact with the side canal walls, which would be uncomfortable for the patient. But by just by curling it ever so slightly, you're going to avoid making contact with the ear canal wall itself. So that's 
the patient's ear. We're not, as I said, we're not going to get all that. So that skin is still attached to the canal. It's just swollen, and but it's still not shedded. So I'm really happy with that. So these are all the plugs of dead skin. There's going to be quite a few still images. And you see that silvery matrix. Again, that's a hallmark of keratosis obtrans. You get that white, silvery exterior that's enveloped over the, the wax plug. And that's a sheet of dead skin that's dyed, shedded. But the skin cells still attach to each other to form a sheet. They're not individual skin cells. And that's the final plug as well. See some sections are darker. They're the, they've been there for longer. They've oxidized. The white sections are some of the fresher dead skin that's only recently shedded off the ear canal. And you're going to see a collective view in a moment. Considering how small this patient's and how petite the ear canals were, it was a considerable blockage they experienced. And I wouldn't even go as far as saying life-changing to have it removed today. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video, guys. Take care, keep well, and speak soon. Bye.